What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Insurrection Inc. podcast. Thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the Insurrection Inc. podcast. I'm your host, Andrew, along with another lovely host, Jay. It is just us tonight. Uh, this is not an after hours. This is actually a normal episode, but of, unfortunately, the person who wanted to record this episode originally decided to put his ass to sleep. Uh, so Porter will not be here. Stratty is not here for unknown reasons, um, mainly because we haven't inquired, but I'm sure they're legitimate. So it's just me and Jay tonight. Um, this is a normal episode, not after hours. Lately, so. Stratty needs like a week in advance to know when to record. Yeah, Stratty's got a lot going on, though, so I understand. He's He really ain't been the same since he started another show and betrayed us. It, it happens to the best of us. Yeah. Can't trust Porter, anyone. Porter has COVID, so he probably knocked yeah, out. COVID, he's weak. Porter's a little bitch. <laughs> Imagine, Imagine getting being... COVID. I can never get it, bro. Yeah. Ever. Um, uh, and Tim, of course, is asleep because it is like yeah, it's like four well, surprisingly he's asleep because usually he doesn't sleep. But you know, he's in Germany, so he's about six hours ahead. Yeah, today he was like, "Sorry, guys, I will not stay up till one a.m. at my computer." Like, what do you normally do, asshole? You're always at your computer at one. He in the drinks morning. himself to sleep every night. And usually falls asleep <laughs> at five in the morning. <laughs> Yeah, but anyway, uh, like we said, it's not an after hours tonight. We're actually going to try to get some serious shit out because right. Andrew and I accidentally started having a serious conversation before we started recording and did not hit record. <laughs> yeah, I, like we actually just stopped, had to stop halfway through. I'm like, hey, <laughs> let's, use, let's do this episode. It's just me and you. Let's go at each other's throats a little bit. <laughs> Peacefully, of course. Yeah, of course. He's um, not ready to kill me yet. Emphasis nah. on yet. Um, so the topic we were talking about, he, he we basically just gone over, we joked about us always being at each other's throats. And, uh, we, it was basically this, he asked, uh, Jay asked, it was like, what things do we disagree on? Like, like legitimately, of course he mentioned uh, more, uh, the spiritualist versus materialist thing, but that's some, like just some esoteric bullshit. I harp him on. It's some, I don't even care that much about materialism or spiritualism. It's just some group chat it's bullshit. Not, yeah. I'm just, I'm just messing with him for the most part. But then the next thing was, uh, voting. Because he mentioned yeah. that I kind of given up on voting, uh, which isn't the case. Although I have been uh, more on Twitter, at least I've been a little more vocal on political stuff than I have on Instagram. Um, and some things have been can be seen as against voting. Uh, but I, 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 where were we going with that? Like I can't remember. Like I know I've mentioned my tweet. Should I reread it? Uh, yeah. Well, first let's give him some context. So like, yeah, there were earlier episodes, about two or three of them, where once I started. In- embracing agoras more and i took a more hardline philosophical stance and you ut- well, more utilitarian stance my philosophical stance on voting hasn't really changed that much if for me it's really utilitarian which is rare and yeah so those few times that we recorded an episode andrew usually either in the middle of the episode or after the episode got very pissed with me and didn't want to talk to me <laughs> yeah so and recently he's come around a little more but read him your tweet and let him know what's going on. So the tweet in question it was a originally a retweet of another one. And the person was asking, is the Libertarian Party a tool for spreading liberty? Or is the LP just a bunch of tools being used by other people <coughs> with bad intent? Um, or a bunch of tools, period. Yeah, just <laughs> that too. Not the sharpest <laughs> knives in the drawer. Um, and of course, I retweeted a, a, a kind of lengthy thread. Uh, and I stated, a tool is only as useful as a person using it. The issue isn't the LP, but those in the LP. People give on the LP because of how it has been used, but ignore the fact that we can change who is using it. You don't tell a bad mechanic to try using a different tool to fix the problem. You just fire the mechanic and get a better one. You don't get a new gun because you can't hit a target. You get a, you can't hit a target because you suck ass and need to get better. Not using the LP from a philosophical standpoint is one thing, but giving up on the potential giving up on the potential simply because it doesn't go your way here and now shows a lack of determination and evidence that you have a constant gratification problem. And of course, that last bit, that's irrelevant to the whole conversation. But uh, what we were getting into is the philosophical versus um, just in general arguments against voting, particularly with the LP. Now, of course, Jay sits from a more philosophical standpoint. So in the grand scheme of things, I don't really hate him for it. It's just in the, in the moment. I'm like, bro. Because um, most, most libertarians that are against voting uh, – at least from what I can tell, do it from a very defeatist standpoint. Like, oh, they don't line up perfect with my views. They're, it's like the whole, they're not a real libertarian <laughs> thing. Um, Beijing Bushido. Least, yeah, that. <laughs> that guy. Um, <laughs> not nah, a little Bushido. I haven't talked too much, but whatever. Um, Gotta have him on again. He wants to bullshit about the LP. 
He has some of course he does. To, he has some shtick he wants to run where he wants to run their social media page. He's Dutch. Why do we want to let a foreign interference in our election? We've never done that. <laughs> of course, we can't have foreign intervention in our elections. No, the Dutch, not in America. The Dutch, are, the Dutch are helping Trump win. Look, people think it's the Jews. People think it's the Irish. No, it's the Dutch. <laughs> been, well, that's still, been... that's still me, so I'm still subverting it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, you can't escape it, Jay. Um, how else did the Chinese learn how to build islands, bro? They learned it from the Dutch. <laughs> um, Probably unironically. Honestly, yeah. <laughs> Let's be real. But yeah, no. So philosophically, that, like, we've all heard the argument. Voting is violence, right? Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the argument. And I can understand it, but I don't sympathize much with it because I also understand the argument of defensive voting, which, of course, does lead to some people voting Republican because they consider it better than the alternative where we've all heard the phrase conservatism is progressivism driving the speed limit at Austin so, Peterson. Yeah. Well, it's more of a Michael Malice thing, but he stole that from Peterson. I uh, no, Peterson stole it from Malice. I mean, but I was talking about is, Peterson coming out and saying he's going to vote Trump because the left oh, needs to be stopped. <laughs> yeah. Well, he also thinks that the bombing innocent Japanese civilians is okay. So I mean, with, with nukes, let's be, let's be honest. <laughs> well, you know, in words of the man who, in words him, of the man who couldn't be here tonight, uh, Porter, he said, I want to kill civilians, just not Japanese ones. <laughs> <laughs> I can get but, that too. So the argument, like defensive voting, it, it makes some sense that you're going to vote because you want to at least slow the progress of statism and Republicans, in theory, line up more with what a libertarian would talk about. So I understand the arguments for defensive voting as well, which could also lead to people voting libertarian. So philosophically, I understand the argument for both sides, and I don't have a strong conviction either way. You know, personally, I don't care much for voting. I don't think it does anything. And I don't think voting libert I I, th I think all of us can agree that at least in our current atmosphere, voting libertarian isn't going to do a whole lot unless you're thinking of like, I'm playing the long con and I'm trying to build up the libertarian party. But voting libertarian, like you, you put in your vote for Joe Jorgensen. Well, we all know she's not going to win. So you're doing it as a sort of either a protest or a means of building up the party, right? Yeah, definitely. Because once they hit that 5% mark, I think they get federal funding, which will boost the LP even more. Yeah. Um, but, then, but then the debates are run privately, so they set the rules all they want, and she'll, she'll, never, she'll never be on the debate stage. I'm not worried about her being on the debate yeah. stage. Getting that federal funding alone for the whole party, especially with Nick Swarwark getting out of there, it'll be yeah. put to pretty good use in more advertising. And plus, she's, the recent news came out that she's is guaranteed to be on all ballots in all 50 states. Oh, That's pretty crazy. That. And one of the reasons uh, Gary Johnson got 4.8%, 4.2%, whatever it was in 2016, it was simply because he was a third option on the list. Yeah. People saw his name and was like, hey, that's not one of these two retards. Let's go with this guy. I don't know who he is, but who cares? And just having Joe Jorgensen's name on there is, I think is going to be a significant, I, I think it's going to be enough to get at least 5%. I don't, th I don't think it's going to be some, I don't think she's going to win a state. If she does, it's going to be New Hampshire, but that doesn't really mean it. it's like three electoral votes. Um, and New Hampshire is also overrun with mass holes. Like libertarians are getting drowned out there. Yeah, that too. Um, but it's going to be enough to put us over. It's it's going to gain some attention. Mm -hmm. Like there's already been reports of the of the Jorgensen campaign being attempted to be sabotaged by Biden campaign members. And of course, uh, I think I, I don't remember exactly what the Trump side has done, but I remember something on the Trump side also messing with the LP. Because I know Biden's side, of they allegedly uh, stole the Doe name, name uh, Joe for Liberty, that she had on um, on her Twitter for a while, um, or something like that. And they stole that domain name for a website. So when people went to that website, it just redirected to Joe Biden's website, rather than Joe Jorgensen's. But of course, Joe never had, or Jorgensen, I should probably say Jorgensen, rather than just Joe, because there's two Joes. <laughs> Uh, Jorgensen never had that domain to begin with, so it didn't matter. But there was an attempt at that. Someone within the Biden campaign did that. Yeah, you so know, it wasn't Biden's idea. <laughs> no, it definitely wasn't. He's not smart enough for that. Um, but there's definitely, there's, there's, it's causing concern with the two bigger parties for sure. Do I think this election is going to be some landslide victory for the libertarians? Hell no. But is it enough to gain some more attention and make people realize that, hey, there's a chance, albeit small, there's still a chance. 
And my issue with people that are anti-voters, again, not like you, because you're from a philosophical standpoint, but the people who are like, oh, we're not going to win. There's no point in voting. The defeatist attitude. That's what I can't stand. It's like, if you're not going to vote, one of the two big parties are going to win anyway. If you vote libertarian, one of the two parties are going to win anyway, but the libertarian party gets more attention. So I'd say vote anyway. Sure. Is it a waste of time in the grand scheme of things? Yes. Are you standing in line for maybe an hour just to click a couple check marks on a piece of paper? Yes. But long term, I think it's a lot better just because get more attention long term. So it is about building up the party for me, at least, because there is potential. Like I said, in the tweet, change the change the handler, not the tool. And so the from a normal perspective, I understand it and I agree with it to some extent. If this is your view of the strategy, then it makes sense to invest time into that. I think there are better places to invest your time and energy, but if you're a person who really wants to use the electoral system and try to, because the, the gist of it is try to use the Libertarian Party to reach a point, not to, not even to ever really win, because we all understand like one person in the government, two people, three, even 10 people in the government mm -hmm. is not going to do a whole lot to make any positive change for liberty. We all get that. Mm -hmm. So it's really to try and sort of revitalize what Ron Paul did. And that's really the long term goal. Like, Get to this position where you can have someone who is up there in a federal election with a lot of media attention, even if they're trying to draw them out, with a lot of media attention, trying to get a principled message out there to try and reach people like Ron Paul did. And that's mm -hmm. really the goal that a lot of libertarians have. Now, if you're, if you're going to go for the goal of having electoral votes and having uh, seats in Congress, this is an odd uh, parallel to consider, but you got to do it a very uh, grassroots way and focus on local <laughs> stuff. Um, much like the Nazis did. <laughs> it's a weird parallel to make. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> but polar opposites here um, are just about. And, and, and to give the Libertarian Party credit, they do a lot of that. The state yeah. parties do work a lot at even positions you would not think of getting a Libertarian elected in. They do it. And I, I, mm -hmm. I got to give them credit for that. Like they do get Libertarians in, in local government. So that is a plus to the Libertarian Party. Yeah, do, I think like... that's, do I think that's a viable strategy? Not really. But they do do it. Yeah. But like from a political standpoint, again, I'm not agreeing with the Nazis at all. But like the way the Nazis did their political strategy after they attempted their coup um, in Germany, I mean, it was just like the Libertarian Party should be doing. I mean, like uh, with the first election after the coup, I don't remember the exact year, uh, the Nazis ended up getting three seats in the German parliament, just three. The next one they had they ended up getting a little bit more and then a little bit more and a little bit more. And then the one where Hitler was made chancellor, they ended up having 107 in the parliament just by increasing a little bit at a time in specific regions. Um, like one of the things I went to one of the debates, and of course, I think we talked about it on one of the episodes way back when. Yeah, we did. Um, but one of the things they did at the debates, albeit it was a short segment, they asked the candidates questions that were specific to Alabama. Of course, I'm in Alabama. So of course they asked stuff about Alabama. Um, and that was very good. It was very good for getting local people to be a part of it. Now, unfortunately, uh, there was like hardly anyone there. And of course, nobody was going to be tuned into Facebook Live watching it because they didn't do enough advertising. The Libertarian Party of Alabama is very, very, very small. Um, so, of course, there's not going to be a lot of advertising for it. And they, could they do better? Yes. Is it run by a bunch of like old soccer moms? Yes. So it definitely could be better. Um, but it's, it's that little bit at a time uh, starting at this local level. And then work up to the state. And once states have all of that influence, then districts for the representatives can be taken, and then Senate. Uh, and it's a long-term goal, very long-term. Um, and uh, given the political climate and all the conspiracy stuff, um, I don't think there's going to be able to be another election where libertarian chance. But um, if you're going to vote at all, or if you're not going to vote because of defeatism or whatever, still try just for the sake of getting more attention. Maybe things will change. Maybe there won't be any conspiracy stuff happen. Um, but it's, it's a long-term goal. That's, that's where I see it. Um, but I'm glad you brought up the conspiracy theme because that's one of the things that turned me away from the Libertarian Party mm -hmm. is the amount of spook influence. And oh, hold on, my dog, my dog is in the room and he's opening my door. But yeah, so the spooks, and I mean, the spooks are there because this is a party near Washington. And this is a party that 
legitimately it does pose a risk to the establishment even if people don't think it does because it's a very ineffectual party right now this is something that if allowed to grow it can be a risk to the powers that be because this is a party that is anti-federal reserve is a party that's anti-tax it's a party that's anti-military industrial complex anti-prison industrial complex anti-crony this is a threat so in the same way that the dhs keeps a watch list of people who hold these beliefs in general th that to allow them to organize is something that would be foolish from these people who have a very long-term vision of their goals for power it would be very it would be a foolish oversight for them to go hey we're going to let all these people that are against what we stand for have a means to achieve power in this country that will allow them to dismantle this power so the spooks remain this <laughs> this threat of infiltrating the party derailing it and making sure it never achieves anything so even if I don't think Joe Jorgensen herself is a spook, I think she's a very, she has stupid cultural messages. She's very out of touch with the culture war. But I think she's a very principled libertarian, and I think she knows her shit. She is not stupid. But when you look at the way she was elected, how the Libertarian Party establishment used the COVID pandemic to their advantage to put her, who was not really polling that high throughout the primaries to put her into power and how it seemed like everyone out of nowhere that didn't get elected, they had their backers vote for her, how they suspended all the rules for the election and put her in place. Then it makes it seem like she's the Manchurian candidate, even if she doesn't mean to be as sort of a derailment for the party because of her stupid cultural messages that get more of a reach than the political messages because politically she's very sound but culturally she's very you know very establishment and that poses a threat and it, it makes it seem like she was put in there on purpose over someone like hornberger who is you know was his whole campaign was centered around i'm anti-cia i'm anti-fbi they're the, they're one of the biggest threats to freedom in existence even someone like john mons who i listened to some of his shit and he was you know, he was an all right candidate. Which I was, was fine he? with him. Uh, he was the black one from Georgia. Okay, I couldn't remember his name. He was really cool. I liked him. Yeah, he was good. He was also really good. But then he lost. A lot of other people lost. And they all end up having their backers put their votes towards Jorgensen, who came out of nowhere. So I think that this threat of the establishment coming in, they're always going to try to put roadblocks in the Libertarian Party to prevent it from getting big. With, you know, Libertarian Party getting big also can pose a completely different threat of becoming watered down as it gets filled with more people who only half-heartedly believe in the message and they see it getting big and they want to use it as a means to get to politics and you end up in the same position as any other political party, just this time it's called Libertarian and it becomes another party that is completely out of touch with its meaning. There are a lot of threats with Libertarian Party getting big, both towards the establishment and towards itself. And I think that's something that's very hard to grapple with. And for libertarians, I, I see other strategies that can exist that do a lot more. Because like I said before, the Libertarian Party came into being in the 70s when there was not an easy way for libertarians to organize, spread literature, and spread a message. It was there as an advertisement platform in, in essence, but it was never a very good one. And... We're at this point now where, I mean, every libertarian has a podcast, right? Yeah, it's, just about, it, it's a running joke. On social media. Yeah, it's a running joke. Like, no, I'm not subscribing to your podcast. So everyone has this message they want to spread. We all, you know, talk to our friends and family until they don't want to listen to us anymore. We, the meme pages have become a, literally a form of mimetic warfare where we've talked about this before too. We're making propaganda. Mm-hmm. And we're propagandizing people. And sure, it's a funny propaganda, but that's what makes it good propaganda. Yeah, regardless so, of what the meme says, there's still a message that's being put in subconsciously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And comedy just has this very good way of getting past people's sort of barriers they set up in their mind. Because once you laugh, your defenses are down and you think a little more clearly mm -hmm. over what it's trying to tell you. So there are a lot of things logistically that I think pose flaws for the Libertarian Party. So you mentioned defeatism, and 
in some way there's a level of defeatism but it's not entirely like oh this is hopeless because we have a bad candidate i think it's a maybe it's just from the people i follow i don't know yeah but i see no, it a lot I, because i've seen and i understand the frustration with jorgensen i was never a supporter of hers and i was a very hesitant member of the lp at that point because i had only joined because of hornberger mm -hmm. and besides that i was critical of the lp before that and i remained critical of the lp during it i liked the mises caucus and i liked hornberger and the Mises Caucus is growing. So there is a potentiality that the Mises Caucus could take over the spooks in the party and put a principled message in there just through the overwhelming numbers of people joining the party. And if that's what people want to do and they think that is really worthwhile for them to try and take over the party and they think they can do something with it, okay, whatever. It's not my preferred strategy. I wouldn't do it. I don't do it. I have other, I have other methods I practice. And I think they work well for me. I think they'd work well for a lot of people. But I can't force it. And I am not interested in starting fights with every person I meet in such a limited pool of people of an ideology. Mm -hmm. So oh, yeah. at the end of the day, if the Mises Caucus can actually do something with the party, power to them. I just don't think they're going to get that far at the end of the day, even if they do take control of the party. Mm -hmm. It goes back to that other episode that I mentioned, that like one where I got mad at you. Um, uh, everyone has their own strategy, you know, like, of course, I tend to go for the more political system style strategy, just because that's what I enjoy. It's what I feel like I could be good at. I mean, like, I, especially doing podcasting, my, my speaking skills have gotten better. Yeah. Um, I now speak better than my own professors <laughs> and they, they get paid to do it. Like I'm doing it for free and I feel like I've gotten uh, a lot better, but, and of course people like you, they tend to, you tend to lead more agorist. I do like counter economy and uh, subversion of the state and whatnot. And other people, yeah. they focus on defensive warfare in a sense. Um, yeah. And there's nothing wrong with defense. Of course, there's some more offensive people, but eh, pick and choose those people, I guess. Some of them are all right. But yeah, they're, the majority the thing, of them are really sort of brain dead. <laughs> yeah, but another thing is that I just thought about just now is that just like everyone has their different strategies, if you don't follow the strategy of voting, I don't think you should keep your mouth shut. But like, don't discourage other people who do take that strategy of voting in the electoral system. Have them try to promote that as much as possible. You promote your stuff and then help each other out when the time comes. So like me, let's yeah. just take us for example. You promote agorism, promote agorist things like counter economy, learning how to farm, learning to be self-sufficient and not rely on the state, not rely on the economy and drain the state of its resources. Me, I focus on the electoral system. I help with campaigns. I uh, talk about how we can vote, like what elections are happening where and how we can do this from the bottom up. And when the time comes, if I can help you in any way to do agro stuff, I'll, I'll do it 100%. I'll help you. But in, when the time comes for voting stuff, I, of course, I can't force you to do that. But in it, figuratively speaking, you'd also help me. So yeah. both strategies are boosted while at the same time not tearing each other down. Uh, like Sal the Agrist, he's a cool guy to talk to. Of course, recently he's been in some shit for stuff he said on Twitter. <laughs> um, yeah, but he's he's constantly berating the LP, and I, understandably so. He's a very staunch agorist, um, more of a Konkin type rather than Hess, like uh, Porter is. Um, so I understand where he's coming from. But the infighting isn't going to help. That's where the that's where the, like the whole joke that you're not a real libertarian. There's constant <laughs> libertarian infighting because people are talking about oh you're not principled enough. Oh you, this is the wrong idea. Like you shouldn't be voting or you shouldn't be doing that. It's a waste of time. Um, it's, it's not healthy. It's not going to work. Is it good? I maybe for strategizing in that very instant. Yes. But long-term it's not going to help. It just makes us look like a bunch of idiots that don't know what we're doing. And frankly, I, at this point, I don't think, I don't think we do know what we're doing. Nobody does. Um, they haven't had the opportunity to. And I think a problem with that is just people not realizing what I'm saying. Like you, everyone has their own strategy they have to go for. Um, but of course debate about it. Don't get me wrong, but if you want things to proceed, you got to let things flow. Um, and if, and I, if one strategy ends up fucking up, okay, let it fuck up. Focus on your thing. Let the other side fuck up. And at the end of the day, there are some people that are just better at grassroots campaigning, and I don't understand it. I don't understand why they want to use that energy that they have in grassroots campaigning, not doing some other message of uh, some other form of messaging. But they do it, and okay, whatever. It's not for me. And of course, you know, Twitter for, for me is one giant shit post. So when I shit on somebody, it doesn't 
fully reflect what I believe. You know, it's more of my internet persona coming out, which is more of the trollish side of my personality, just like to liking to start stoke flames. So I'll go to someone who believes in the party and I'll just tweet, uh, imagine believing in voting. That it, yeah, it, it's just it's just search on the internet. It's, it's yeah. They want to do it. They want to do it. Whatever you know, it's their life, not mine. That's sort of part of the, in some ways, part of the libertarian credos. That's another debate that people have. But mm-hmm. at the end of the day, so you know, it's their time, they're spending it the way they think is fit. Well, you know, I disagree. I try to tell them, hey, you know, there are better ways you can do it. But if they don't want to. Do it, they don't want to do it. I think it also comes down to just uh, what message you can spread easier. Like me, I feel like, uh, of course, I've been told this before by other people that I, I do have, I, and I, I, I don't want to sound like an arrogant prick when I say this, but I've been told by people in many uh, different circles that I do have leadership potential. So, of course, and I see myself having that too. Of course, I'm trying and, to be as humble as possible. I'm not trying to be a dick when I say that. Like, I'm not trying and to... No, you do. With the way you lead 15-year-olds on Instagram, <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you're a cult leader. You are a cult leader. Um, Ironically. But, like, with that, I, I, I just find myself naturally leaning towards leadership positions mm-hmm. as well. And I, it's, it's hard for me to find a leadership position in a system like agorism, which is solely focused on self-sufficiency yeah. and individualism. Don't get me wrong. Individualism is great, but I work better when I'm at the head of a collective of some sort. So I, I tend to focus on more of the political stuff, which is why I have these long-winded tweets and have these rants on these stupid podcasts um, about stuff that doesn't matter. Uh, it's just a part of my nature. So I think another part of it's like that. And plus, for me, it's easier to convince people of a voting method and convincing them just the bare bones philosophical side of libertarianism rather than going out and convincing people. It's like, hey, uh, abandon uh, your way of life now and focus on this completely other way of life while trying to be completely independent of everything outside of your own property. <laughs> Some people can do it better than I can because I know you can, Jay. I know you can do it. Me, I feel like I could if I talked to the right people, but from, from to the layman, I can't. I, I don't know a way to properly express that without being long-winded. You know what I'm saying? And, yeah, no, I get that. Like, you, I also feel like I've been told I have better leadership positions and it manifests in different ways. So now that I've been, you know, running a business, I find I'm better at managerial positions and I'm good at leading people in a philosophical way. Not so mm-hmm. much like, oh, I'm leading the charge and telling them what to do. You're I'm better at, yeah, I'm better. Hey, I'm a better salesman. I'm better at showing them a path and convincing mm-hmm. them of a certain thing to do. Because a lot of people come to me and they ask me for like advice and they ask me for the for philosophical answers to questions. Like they know I'm read up on theory, so they come, they ask me shit, and they they're looking for guidance. So I take on more of a guidance role rather than you know a so more of a philosophical leadership role than an action leadership role where mm-hmm. I wouldn't be so good because. I'm not the greatest planner when it comes to a business. Yeah, sure. I'm pretty, I'm pretty good with that. Mm -hmm. I'm good at leading a business. He asked me like how to lead strategy. Fuck man. I don't know. Yes. Whatever works best for you. So that's why I lean towards agorism because I like the hyper individualistic aspect of that and how you're achieving Liberty for yourself and you don't have to become a martyr for anything. I like that. And I like leading people towards that because I think it's a very viable route, but you know, if you came to me and you asked me, like, okay, well, how can we organize the party? Fuck if I know. I'm an internet troll. <laughs> I don't unite people. I get them to fight. Have you read um, Rules for Radicals yet? No, fuck, not yet, no. Not yet? No, I've been busy with work. Understandable. I feel like your opinion will change a little bit once you read that. At least oh, and I, I want to read it, and I, you know, I understand, which is something I wanted to lead into. We're leading towards not towards rules for radicals, but I understand like how that helps people become better, quote unquote, community organizers. <laughs> you know, eh, in a sense, the, yeah. Well, community organizers really it just can. a left. It it's can. a left. It's a leftist term for I'm leading direct action. <laughs> yeah. It's if you, if, dear listeners, if you hear someone call themselves a community organizer, kill them. Yeah, they're not teaching people how to start gardens in their neighborhoods. They're teaching them how to burn down buildings. Depending on the building, that's pretty based, but you know, most of the time it's not. <laughs> but it, it's an interesting thing that when you brought up that the Nazis were very grassroots, which they mm-hmm. were, it was a very, you know, there were sections of the country that they just could not take over because of the cultural ethic. Well, I see you're raising your hand. So yeah, I was just reminding myself, this is a topic we can get to yeah. after we get done talking about the LP, but, but it's a good topic so yeah, and connects to it. There were like, pockets of germany that they could not lead 
culturally because there were just different cultural values within that. But they did end up grassroots winning over politically a majority of the country. They won over a lot of Germany with their grassroots movement. They got ninety nine point eight percent of the popular <laughs> yeah. vote. Like <laughs> exactly, but then they did a good you, job. <laughs> but then you take a look at Russia, which basically it looked completely different with how they led the revolution, because we know the Bolsheviks. Everyone knows the Bolsheviks, but why do we know the Bolsheviks? Because their strategy was the polar opposite of the Mensheviks, mm -hmm. and the Mensheviks. If you look at modern libertarianism, you can draw the parallels where the Boogaloo boys, if they were more offensive than defensive, they would be the Bolsheviks of the libertarian move of the mm -hmm. liberty movement. But the Mensheviks would be the libertarian party members who the Mensheviks were very much, well, we want to affect the intellectuals. We want to affect the political class and we want to have a slow takeover of the government. So we don't have too radical of a shift in society. We want to convince a lot of people. And the Mensheviks were very ineffectual. So the Mensheviks, nobody remembers them because the Bolsheviks beat them out. The Bolsheviks, they, they quite literally beat them out. They forced mm -hmm. them out of Russia. There yeah. were no Mensheviks by the end of 1917. And to be fair, was, the Menshevik strategy of long term is uh, working at this point, just not in the right it, country. It is. <laughs> but in Russia, the Bolsheviks had a mm -hmm. very radical offensive movement, and it was both ideologically and physically offensive. So you see like the Bolshevik praxis of burn shit down and instigate a cultural shift. But then you also see the Bolshevik strategy of having an offensive philosophical attack mm -hmm. happening. So you can draw the parallels to the Liberty Movement today. You know, the Boogaloo Boys, which, thank God we're not typing that because that would get this Discord yeeted off the internet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but saying it is okay. So the Boogaloo Boys, they are the... If they were more offensive, they'd be the Bolsheviks. And Agorists fall, you know, somewhere in between where they don't want to take a physical stance like the Bolsheviks did, but they don't want to take a political stance like the Mensheviks did. And Libertarian Party, yeah, <laughs> exactly. The Libertarian Party would be the Mensheviks, where they want to have this very slow baby step change, which does work. Because look at the progressives, mm -hmm. you know, the progressives had baby steps, and to this day, they work in baby steps. Well, not but so when much you're, anymore, but... not so much anymore, but to start, they had their baby steps and it mm -hmm. worked. But when you're trying to instill a radical shift like libertarianism, you're left with different strategies. Mm -hmm. so i wouldn't call what the nazis did the menshevik route mm -mm. it was i think it was a mix of both yeah it was it was closer to yeah it was it's closer to a mix because towards the end of it you know the brown shirts did start getting a little bit more violent mm -hmm. it was a little bit more physical of movement but by that point they had already solidified a lot of public support in germany I just want to take a quick break to announce that we have a Patreon now, where you can support us with money for some reason. That is patreon.com slash insurrection inc. And if you don't want to support us with fiat, you can go to float.app slash insurrection inc. That is f-l-o-t-e dot app and give us cryptocurrency. And if you don't want to give us money monthly, because why would you? You can go on down to our merch shop and pick something you like. Links will be in the description and don't forget to join our discord. Now back to the show. Mm-hmm. Um, the other topic I wanted to bring up, I wanted to bring it up earlier, but I had forgotten about it because we talked about more of the LP. But uh, for those of you that have paid close attention to uh, small party politics, uh, a new party is formed uh, August 15th, 2020. The National Justice Party formed officially as a chairman. It's five other members. It's, it's a very small party. And in the, in the meeting that they had um, where they did the... Uh, opening conference or opening speech or whatever uh only had like 200 members there and not to mean like they don't have supporters other where or other places um but they only had 200 members at that place they are a to put it simply a fascist um party uh to put it very simply they're a fascist party they only line up actually i wouldn't even say fascist they say more nationalist uh they tend to line up a lot with nazism um but they formed recently, and I've noticed that even they're being subverted already by uh, Trump. Of course, not that I'm wanting the NJP to uh, get out there, but just like how I mentioned earlier how the Biden campaign, or at least someone in it, 
uh, got exposed of trying to mess with the Jorgensen campaign. And of course, Trump's also done some stuff to mess with libertarian. Oh yeah, he was, I remember now, he was doing more libertarian style policies to get libertarians on his side when Jorgensen got the nomination. I remember that. Um, but recently, after the NJP formed, I assume word got to Trump. Of course, it surely did. But, uh, I mean, look at this last week. Just two days ago, Trump got rid of the um, critical race theory classes for federal for federal um, employees. Why would he do that? And especially at a time like this, with all these uh, race riots going on? Are you kidding me? That's like the worst opportune time to do it if you're trying to calm the riots. So instead, he gets rid of the critical race. Like, for those that didn't know what the critical race theory classes were, it was the classes that the federal uh, employees had to take saying all white people contribute to racist, all white people are racist, and if they were a white person, they had to admit that they contribute to racism, that lefty stuff. Um, that was in the government. That's from the Obama era, and Trump kept it in all the way up until just a couple of days ago and got rid of it at a time like this. And personally, I think that was trying to get people to n not even think about looking at the NJP. Because, of course, the NJP is something like, well, Trump doesn't work for the white man. He's working for all these other things, He's working for the bankers and whatnot. Um, that's what the NJP was saying in their opening speech. Um, so, of course, Trump comes out and does that thing where they get rid of the critical race theory. Someone else uh, on Twitter the other day, he retweeted a tweet, and it was someone saying that California schools are initiating Project 1619, which is a thing that uh, the New York Times started doing in the, as a, like a media thing, newspaper, magazine thing, where they'd, uh, they were attempting to reshape American history to focus more on the, sla the slaves and indigenous people and take the focus away from white people. And, of course, someone mentioned that in, on Twitter saying, oh, the California schools are initiating Project 1619. Of course, Trump retweeted that. He says, okay, they're doing that. No more funding for them. Like, one, that's funny. And two, it's another thing like the getting rid of the critical race theory stuff. It's a it's trying to bring in support from more white people, more people who care about that, the more white nationalist types, uh, the more people, the people who would have would support the NJP, the National Justice Party, if they knew it existed. I think it's one of the things just trying to distract, trying to get rid of the thing. Because if the NJP picked up ground, you'd see a lot of republic. I don't think you'd see any establishment Republicans leave, but you'd see some Republicans leave and go join the NJP, the more radical Republicans in the sense of ideology, more radical conservatives go join the NJP. It would split up the party because the libertarian conservatives would split up, the, would leave the Republican party if the Republican party broke up and the NJP would still be there. Um, so the Republican party has potential for splitting. If these other two parties can get big has potential, just like the Green Party. Of course, the Green Party, like no one hears about. I mean, Jill Stein ran in 2016. Most people don't even know who she is. Jill Stein ran most elections. Like, she's been hmm. running a long time. Is she running again this year? I don't think so. I haven't heard anything about the Green Party this year. Let me, let me see. You keep talking, I'm going to look it up. Um, but like just in the sense that, of course, there's the Democratic Socialist of America. I don't think they're a political party. I think they more fall in line with the Democrats, especially since they go with the vote blue no matter who. Uh, but if there is, there's a Communist Party, in America, there is a, um, of course, there's the Green Party, which is a more uh, lib left, uh, social libertarian uh, style party, um, focusing a lot on um, nature and uh, green energy and whatnot. There's that. So the Democratic Party has a lot of potential for breakups too, but of course they're not seeing that. At least it's not being talked about <laughs> because they have a lot to lose if Trump wins again. Did you did you know the youth wing of the Green Party is called the Young Eco Socialists? I did not. Well, the yes, the yes, yeah, <laughs> the progressive rock band has actually been the Green Party front this entire time. Really? Yeah. Yes. Oh. <laughs> oh. Okay. Gotcha. Um. But like, see, I, both these parties, like the major parties, do have potential for breakups. You had the more radical off lefters in the Democratic Party that would have probably would have gone with Bernie Sanders, going to support the DSA if they ever broke off and formed their own party, or the Communist Party. And of course, you'd have the more social liberals that would probably fall in Elizabeth Warren. I'm cutting out a whole bunch. Um, you'd say the ones who, the supporters of Elizabeth, Elizabeth Warren going for the Green Party. Is there a chance that they still might this election? Maybe. Is it going to make much of a difference? Definitely not at all, because they're, the Democrats have so much to lose. Um, personally, I think Trump is going to win. Um, I'd be surprised if he didn't, actually. Do I think seats might change? Maybe. I don't know. Um, I have no idea. I, I, I haven't been keeping up enough with state level politics to see how districts might change. All the cities that riots are in, I think they're going to change and could flip more Republican. At least that's what the polls say, but these parties do have threats on all sides. They have the more authoritarian and libertarian extremes of being a threat to the, the centrist parties. 
the Green Party nominee this year is Howie Hawkins, so it's not Jill Stein this year. Oh, dang. I thought he was going to be another one on the list. <laughs> um, I don't remember where I was going with... Oh, I was just talking about the NJP. But, like, th- that's another party that formed. Like, there's... the. I guess I could take it to a, just an increase in political extremism in general and still talking about strategies. Um, like all these things still work. I mean, the voting system is still there. And of course, as more, as more parties show up and become more extreme, I, depending if all the conspiracy stuff happens, um, I could see us becoming at least temporarily a multi-party state. Possible. Uh, Very like possible. Within our lifetimes. If the conspiracy stuff doesn't happen, of course, but giving my massive amounts of esoteric <laughs> knowledge... <laughs> Um, I'm pretty convinced <laughs> that's going to happen too, but it'd be yeah. nice to see it not. And then if it doesn't, I see us becoming a multi-party state, at least temporarily within our lifetimes. Um, yeah. it'll likely given the progressive nature of the, especially these younger, um, generations, like our generations and younger, um, I see it being more, uh, between the libertarian and green party more than something like the NJP or communist party. Uh, the only way the NJP and communist party would get gain traction is being violent in the streets. Um, like right now, it's kind of between uh, the Antifa groups and the BLM versus groups like the Proud Boys. Of course, Proud Boys are more pro-Trump, um, although they tend to be more traditional than the average conservative. Um, and of course, but they're by no means fascist. Um, Not really. They're just sort of traditionalist conservatives. I mean, but... it's just a fraternal society that happens to agree yeah. with Trump. Like, Gavin yeah. McInnes founded it. Of course, Gavin McInnes is disassociated from it to make sure people don't get in trouble for being Proud Boys as much anymore. But they're not a fascist group. Um, but it's going to be stuff like that. There's going to be clashes in the street, just like it was in Germany in the uh, late twenties, early thirties. So why are you saying his name wrong? It's Gavin McIngus. No. Yes. You gotta say it like that to annoy him. Uh, yeah, I've never heard that's that. Mike, that's how Michael Malice says it because they're uh, friends. <laughs> got it. Um, yeah, I've never heard that one before. But I haven't, to, I haven't listened to good old Gavin in a while. It's been a minute. But uh, I think, and he, here's an interesting thing going back to strategy, that I think the NJP can really be a shakeup. The, mm-hmm. Now they're 200. But what is the, you know, strategy, to borrow a term from the left is a very fancy term, the praxis, which I am, I'm very keen on stealing that term. What is the fascist praxis? Uh, emotion. A, emotion, and it's a reactionary movement, which mm-hmm. preys on emotion. So when you have riots in the street from leftist movements, they, they wait for the leftists to act up because that's how they take power because the communists in germany were not friendly they took the bolshevik a- approach mm-hmm. the communists in italy were not friendly they took the bolshevik approach so they wait for these leftists to start acting up and that's when they come in and they say hey we are order we are squashing these people in the street we will squash them politically as well mm-hmm. we are your safe bet so the njp can really become a shakeup. Because when was the fascist party in America popular? The 20s, the 30s, when the socialists here in America were taking the Bolshevik route, when mm-hmm. the Wobblies were bombing factories. I, I, it's going to happen again. It's, it's got, mm-hmm. it's, I'm not saying it's got to, I mean, as in means, like, I hope it does. It's, it's got to just because that's just the nature of things. That's how it seems to be happening now. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm not a, I am not an, what's the word called when you sort of exacerbate everything? Uh, what do you mean? Like calling like, for uh, violence or hoping for it? Like an accelerator? No, no, when you, no, no, no. When you like make everything out to be worse than it actually is. I'm not an alarmist. There you go. I'm not an alarmist. So I don't think that Antifa is the worst thing we've ever seen in this country. Again, the IWW was actually bombing factories in the early 1900s. Give them enough time. <laughs> exactly. So give them enough time. It could very possibly be, especially since these people are getting, you know, not to sound like number two. No, but you Think know, not to, Go ahead. not to sound like boomer con conspiracy, but Antifa does get their money from somewhere. Sure, they're not a, an organized organization, but there are cells within it that are getting funding from mm-hmm. pro establishment can from pro establishment billionaires. Yeah, I mean, if you need any more proof of that, look at all the people and the establishment and billionaires who um, funded the Minnesota Freedom Fund or Minnesota was it Minnesota? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Minnesota Freedom yeah. Fund. Yeah, the bail funds and back in uh, the bail funds. Yeah. Look at the people they bailed out. Mm-hmm. Like they weren't just protesters. These were murderers. These were like felons. These were people who were pedophiles and rapists. Like they were bailing these people out. And Are they you like me? destroyed, they destroyed property in very awful ways. And they were back on the streets within a few days because of this bail fund. Mm-hmm. And you know, uh fuck, where was I going with this? Um 
continue while I get my train of thought back. Um, but what I was going to say a second ago is like, I don't even think they need to start bombing factories. What oh, they no. have now is enough. Like, it's like the difference between back then that with W um, and now with Antifa, there's no need to bomb factories because we see this stuff every day. The difference between now and then is that we see more of the bad stuff than these people could even dream of. I don't think the world's getting a worse place. We're just seeing more of the bad stuff. Overall, oh, sure. I think it's becoming a better place. Um, but of course, at least globally, that is. Regionally, eh, maybe not so much. Um, Every but, empire has its uh, downfall. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, well, except one. <laughs> um, I think you know what I'm talking about. How did you figure it out? Um, Israel? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we see all this bad stuff every day, and it doesn't take much to get people, someone emotionally riled up, especially in the face of violence. The NJP, all they have to do is start, just do what Trump's been doing and saying, oh, it's all the Democrats uh, causing these riots, Democratic controlled cities. Like you've seen the advertisements that Trump's been putting out. They're pretty serious stuff. And they need, like, to, go, and they need to go out there in those protests and stand there with guns. And if somebody accuses them of being white nationalists, say, yeah, no, yeah. we're standing up for these white <laughs> business owners that are having their shit destroyed. And that's going to sell. Yeah, it is. It's going like, to sell. That too. But like, I'm talking about the advertisement Trump has been putting out. Oh, yeah. Edits. Those have been some serious, like some deep stuff. They're oh, pretty intense commercials. He, he's he's good at political strategy. He is. He's very good at advertising. He's a businessman. Of course he is. Yeah. Um, but, but I remember I remember what I was going to say. Uh, if libertarians don't go to protests, you're wasting your time. These people aren't your allies. And for the statists that think you're affecting change with protests, the establishment supports you. You're not changing shit. Yeah. So it's always like people keep saying, like, if the media is on your side, you're not the resistance. Yeah. It's and it's case. true. It, you're really just not the resistance. You're just in another pond. If, like, <laughs> if CNN is saying these are mostly peaceful protests as, as shit is burning down behind them literally, then <laughs> fiery but peaceful protests as like, the town is on fire behind the reporter, you are not changed. You are not the resistance. You, you're not changing shit. You are, you, they want you yeah. to do this. Yeah. It only boosts them. The people you hate the most, you're only helping. Mm -hmm. But um, as I was saying with the advertisements, NJP just has to do the same thing except blame it on different people. Yep. And what gets people riled up more than anything, especially in America, culture and race. I mean, look at any other country. Like, what has, what country has had more racial issues than any other country in the world? It's I, from I can probably safely say America. Um, just because it's been so so many different things, big melting pot that just obviously has not <laughs> had great results. Um, <laughs> um, and I'm just being objective there. I'm not being racist. It's just I, you know, it's look at it. Like, look outside. Look on the yeah. TV every morning. Like, and, of course, the NJP has to do is use that. Of course, there's a way libertarians could do the same thing. They could use that same idea of uh, triggering emotion through using footage of the protest and go to a more individualistic libertarian. Approach. But, of course, the current uh, libertarian establishment isn't smart enough to do that, or they don't want to do that. I think it's more they, they don't, don't want, want to, to because do look, that. They have, the, they have the perfect opportunity. This is the pro-property party. This is the pro-peace party. Mm -hmm. They can say, hey, we are against this. We are offering an alternative where everyone can be prosperous. Everyone can live freely. You don't have to be associated with people you don't want to associate with. And we are against the destruction of property. We will make it so that your business, even if it got burned down, we're going to make it that it's easier on you to start up. And they're, <laughs> they just don't want to do it, I think. The if, if, if you're trying to pull people away from the other parties, another way you could do it is don't even mention the property part. Just mention all the other things. Because obviously, if you mention property at this point, you're seen as the enemy. At yep. least to the people in the streets, that is. So don't even mention the property part. Let the property come later. That's just inherent with libertarianism. They'll figure that out. Um, but focus you on get the people other that stuff. Are, you want to get people that are pissed with their shit getting burnt down. A great way to say it is, hey, we're against your shit getting burnt down. We think you have the absolute right to do what you want with your property. You want to burn it down yourself, burn it down. But well, somebody yeah, else can't come to. But if you're looking to be the pro-peace, focus on the peace part too. Mm -hmm. Focus on actual criminal justice reform. Focus on actual legalization. Of yeah. Focus on actual stuff. Focus on lowering taxes so people would be more wealthy so they wouldn't have to do this stuff. Or, of course, they don't have to now, but like they wouldn't be driven to do this stuff for whatever reason, um, subversive or not. Um, and then, of course, the people who care about the property, you talk to them about the property stuff. Look, do what you need to do to take care of your property, but then also talk to the people damaging the property about the stuff they care about. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's the divide and conquer thing. I mean, the two-party system has been doing it for centuries. We got to do it too. Can't beat them, join them, divide and conquer. Focus on the different groups and talk to them about their specific issues. Like I mentioned earlier about the, at the debate, the 
issues specific to Alabama. Of course, Kokesh ended up having the best answers. And of course, that's the stuff people care about the most um, here in Alabama, the stuff bothering Alabama. We're libertarians. We only care about our, our own area. We don't care about people in California. And Kokesh used that to his advantage. Kokesh ended up winning, albeit there's only like 20 people there voting, but <laughs> Kokesh won that debate. And people voted him saying he was the best guy because he focused on the divide and conquer strategy. Um, which is the best way libertarianism can do it. Focus on specific groups in specific areas and focus on their specific issues. Because they don't care about stuff that's going to be affecting other people. That's not the heart of the libertarianism. If you start focusing on problems that are other people's problems and not the problem of the person you're talking to, then you've just lost the whole libertarian aspect of it. That's what look, I think. Look at the defund the police movement. Libertarians didn't have to tack themselves onto that and kowtow mm -hmm. to what the Democrats were saying defund the police means. Because we've had a strong prince, even more normie libertarians have had a very strong way to enact police reform. Mm -hmm. And so they were trying to tack themselves onto the defund the police message instead of forcefully inserting themselves and being like, hey, these people have it wrong. We don't want to take away your law enforcement, which is what a lot of people were making it sound like, which is going to scare off conservatives. Because like you weren't there for the Pat Watson episode, but... Uh, Pat is an ex-cop. He was an anarchist when he was a cop. And he describes why the bureaucracy can't work and why it needs to be privatized. But the point is, we're not anti-law enforcement. We're just against the monopoly on law enforcement. We want competition on violence, like I said earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Bring back the red market. Come on. <laughs> but it's like, we're not, you know, we don't want to take away your police. We want to give you better police. We want to give you something that, hey, this is going to work for you. And this isn't going to come and beat the shit out of you for selling loose cigarettes. That this, These are going to be people that actually show up when there's a violent criminal in your house. And it's like, hey, we have this better thing. Yeah, defund the police because we want it privatized. We want to give you good police. But, you know, we try to tack ourselves on to defund the police means put more money back into other parts of the government so, so you know, small communities can have more funding. Like, yeah, yeah, really, it's a lack of funding that's the problem in these poor communities, right? Not that their local governments say we need more funding so the federal government gives them money ad infinitum and they, the people never see it because that's the way government works. That's the way politics works. It's Everything's... Um, purely economic factors. Yeah. <laughs> uh, purely economic factors. Purely economic factors. Burgers? But for burger. I got two. Actually, no, I'm so full after what I ate. Which, for the listeners, I you should see what I had for dinner. It was... Oh my god, it was beautiful. It was... Put it on the screen, right here. <laughs> it was, yeah, on the YouTube version. Go listen to the YouTube version. At 52 minutes, uh, it was fucking delicious. But... It's defund the police because then they backpedal and they said, oh, no, we don't want to abolish the police. We just want to take away all their funding and put it into local governments. What the fuck is that going to do? That's not a libertarian message to tack on to. <laughs> well, like a, a better phrase they could have used is like. Of course, the Republicans are like saying, don't do anything to police. Leave it. It's fine. Democrats are like, defund the police. We go for again, go for the in-between work towards the centrists. God forbid Form we work with centrists. We work <laughs> towards them. They're, I promise, if you talk to any centrist, they lean libertarian every time. They yeah. just are Reform too ignorant to understand the libertarian party existing. Reform the police. Reform the police. That's what it is. That's all you have to say. Reform like, the police. Take away, quali take away uh, qualitative immunity. Or, uh, quantitative. Yes, quantitative immunity. End the drug war. End uh, civil asset forfeiture. These are things that, sure, the police won't be perfect because you and I are anarchists. We understand that as long as the government is involved, the police will be awful. Mm -hmm. But if you take, if you, those three things, you end those and policing change because the this drug entire war. entire country will be completely different. The drug war led to the warrior cop. It led to the cop that thinks he's John Wayne going and busting down a door at three in the morning and shooting anyone that comes his way, even if they're not mm -hmm. resisting. You take away quantitative immunity. Well, Shit, then they're going to be way more hesitant because they don't immediately get... Uh, Give them liability yeah. and take away responsibility. So no. they're more, yeah. higher quality work in whatever work they do. And then it's that simple. Also, get and rid of quotas. That's another yeah. big thing. Get rid of quotas. Alabama doesn't have quotas for their cops. 
sure we have a lot of car wrecks, but I think it's just people are bad drivers here. <laughs> yeah. But people which is why for there's stupid reasons. <laughs> which is why there's not as many highway patrol in Alabama or Florida as there are in Georgia. Uh, yeah. Are there, are there, is there no quotas in Florida either? I don't think. If there are, then the police really don't give a shit about it for uh, highway patrol. Because like Andy and I were telling you the other night, the cops will go 20 miles per hour faster than you are when you're already going 20 over the speed limit <laughs> in Florida. Cops but then you cross, you cross over into Georgia and there's a, there's a highway patrol every two minutes on the highway. And you go one mile over the speed limit and they're giving you a $200 ticket. But then in oh. Georgia, one thing they did uh, they upped the limit. They upped what it takes to arrest you for weed. So you can be carrying a couple grams on you and you just get a ticket like you're speeding. They don't arrest you. And that that's, changes a whole lot. Yeah, that's kind of how it is in the county I live in. Like it's decriminalized in this county, in the city of Birmingham as well. Like I, I, it's an exorbitant amount. Like if you're caught with two whole ounces on you, they'll find that, that you. Is, yeah, that is a lot. And fine, they even arrest you. Yeah, they they'll find. Yeah. Like they'll confiscate lot. it and find you. That's, but if you and have anything a, less than that, they'll just find you and you can keep it. As long as like, you claim it's for self-use. Yeah, sorry, if you're going to, nobody's using one, two, <laughs> two ounces of weed for per. But that's, what they, yeah, allow. that's what they allow. You're selling that shit. Like, you're going to a party and you're selling that shit. Or you're just but going you, to a party. It's like, like, they just don't want you selling it. You're not driving like, with two ounces of weed if you're not a dealer. Like, that's just fact. Yeah, like, <laughs> and I, listen, both of us think that you should be able to drive with however much weed you want. But also, the reality is that's a much better system than, oh, you have dust in your baggie. We're going to arrest you. I'll be right back. Keep him entertained. Yeah. And th there are cases where like people have weed paraphernalia and they get arrested. So you change these few things and you change the system. So libertarians tack themselves onto a weak message that watered down what we're doing. And it's a whole lot of, it's a whole lot of pandering. So I said earlier, you know, I can't give you good advice on how to run a libertarian party, but there are still better ways to do it. I, at least I can understand there's better messaging. But, uh, yeah, what I had for dinner, my God, it was all the way for Angela. Let me tell you all about my dinner. So Sunday nights are grilling nights for me. I'm, we're recording this on a Sunday night and I grill. Oh, my dad does the grilling, but I, I'll, I'll take it over from one of these days. Steak, a bunch of sausages. We had bloodwurst. We had chorizo Colorado, chorizo Argentino. Salchicha parigera, ribs, and I was in fucking heaven. A couple of francs, and it was delicious. I mean, the steak, perfect. Perfect. Well, not perfectly cooked. There were a few bits of it that were a little too dry, but about 90% of it was perfect. So 90% is pretty damn good. You know, of course, you know, you, you cook it all the way you want to, but it was good. It was really good. The sausages, Ooh, those sausages, the salchicha parigera. If you have never had salchicha parigera, you need to go to whatever Spanish supermarket is around you. It looks, it's like a giant spiral sausage. You cannot miss it. You throw that on the grill, and that is one of the best sausages you're ever going to eat. Salchicha, or uh, chorizo argentino. Oh, ho, ho, ho. And it was nice. It was spicy. It sort of tastes like breakfast sausage. So if it sort of tastes like breakfast sausage, you know, breakfast sausage, like you agree, breakfast sausage is pretty damn good, right? Yeah, it's good. Well, it depends. Where from, what kind, Link? Like Patty. a real, like a, the, the links, and like real breakfast sausage, not like Jimmy Dean's. It's good. So like- Yeah, the, I'd say it's pretty good. The chorizo- How'd you get here? <laughs> I was, I was talking about the, even a minute. I was, talking, I was talking about the cops, and I was like, I, I can't rant about the cops without somebody else there. So I was like, okay, I'm done with the cops, done with gotcha. Libertarian Party messaging. Let me tell you all about my dinner. <laughs> and then I was like- My dad got me more fucking beer. Nice. Like he texted me and said, okay, first of all, he texted me, he's like, beer 30 in the <laughs> lot. I'm like, what? Okay. And then he asked if I was coming. I'm like, what? I walk out there. He bought a whole other case of Corona light and then got a couple of cans. And he handed me one of the cans. He's like, all right, take that. <laughs> I'm like, okay. So I guess I'm getting <laughs> drunk tonight. <laughs> nice. I was That's just playing with it. Uh, it is a very big can. It's Modelo time, foo. It's Modelo time. Uh, but chorizo argentino, so it's it's spicy and it sort of tastes like a breakfast sausage, but it's got it's not as greasy as a breakfast sausage. It's got a little more beef flavor or pork flavor, and it's just it, it's bigger oh, and, and it's really good. 
since you got another beer, I'm going to go see if there's another beer for me to grab. So you enter. Oh, it's your so turn. so good. It is your turn to entertain everybody. Okay, good thing I had a couple of topics I want to talk about too. All right, uh, so earlier, I'm watching, I was going to get more beer. Um, I, there was two things I want to hold it up. Because Jay saw me hold up the fingers. We have our cameras on, so we can actually coordinate when we talk better. Um, but two things we were talking about earlier when it comes to when we were saying like reform the police and whatnot. Um, something I want to talk about is like encourage neighborhood watches. Neighborhood watches are, have been shown to in better communities and keep them safer because everyone's a police. Of course, it's nothing like your highway patrol who pulls you over for going too over, but neighborhood watches are great. Um, like personally, like my, my little road that we have on, I'm talking about neighborhood watches. Um, um, the little road I live on, we have private property signs at the very front of like, at the turn in the road. There's like six houses on the road and we have neighborhood watch signs. We don't care about the people on the other roads. We just focus on our little road. And it's great. It's a wholesome little community. The gr- our houses look amazing and it's well kept and it looks pretty good. It's a nice wholesome little little road. It's like six houses on it. Um, but neighborhood watches have, are better for almost any community than any sort of police force because it's localized. It's right yep. there with you. And people it's, care it's about incentive. that land. It's incentive. Yeah, you care about the you're on. You care about your neighbors because if your neighbor gets broken into, you're next. Most yeah, likely. definitely. So it's like, um, you care. You care. But the cop who lives on the other side of town. God, that's so good. He only cares about his paycheck, which is another thing that why privatization will work better. Cops, no matter how long you've been working there, no matter how good you are, you're going to have the same paycheck as someone in the same rank as you. You don't get pay. You don't get raises. Mm-hmm. So it's like one incentive. If you can't make someone from across town care about your side of town, really, like you just really can't. They're not going to care about it as much as their part. So how can you make them care? Money. Which is why privatization will work. Good mm-hmm. cops get raises. Bad cops either get demoted or fired. It's just how it works. Incentives work. Yep. Um, even Elon Musk talked about it when all the COVID stuff was happening. He's exposing the truth and being called a conspiracy. Theory. Incentives matter. He pointed that out. It definitely does. Um, well, the I- other thing I wanted to talk about, there was two things I wanted to talk about. Uh, this one is still relating to law and party politics. Um, but recently there's been a, a bill going through the house uh, that um, would legalize marijuana, but, but high taxes, which they'd basically just keep it illegal essentially. Uh, that's, they, the, that's what Canada did. And the black market for weed is still thriving. Yeah. Um, but that's the plan, which honestly, it's a step in the right direction. Let's be honest. Yeah, it's better. It's, it's better. Very, and I, Personally, if it makes it through the House, I kind of think it would make it through the Senate, too, just for the money reasons, because that's more money for the politicians, mm-hmm. more money for the government. It's going to make high, it. It's high taxes and, you know. <laughs> yeah. And plus, you know how many people that get out of jail if they pardon them as well, which I, surely that's part of the bill. I haven't read the bill. Well, I just know that two highlights. It, that's, legalization that's, high how, that's how it might fail, because the prison industrial complex has a lot of money rolling through the system. That is true. Hmm. The only, the only, the only way I could see that uh, coming out in the end is uh, if the tax money from the weed buying gets funneled back into the uh, prison industrial complex. Yeah, I mean that could be a potential. But at the same time, that's less uh, slave labor for the corporations. It is. <laughs> How's um, McDonald's gonna make money if they don't have prison labor? <laughs> honestly, like, like let's be for real. I wonder if there is a McDonald. There's surely there's McDonald's out there with like inmates working. Yes, surely. a lot of them. Right, well, a lot of them. Uh, and for those who think we're bullshitting, read the 13th Amendment. You'll see that we're not. <laughs> yeah, Killer, Killer Mike's song is so fucking good. Um, yeah, no, 13th Amendment still has allowed slavery as a form of punishment, which is why yeah. everything's fucking illegal in the freest country <laughs> in the world. Everybody go listen to Reagan by Killer Mike. I have not listened to it. I will after this. No, dude, that song is so fucking good. Do we have anything else to talk uh, about? Uh... Yeah, you know, you when you bring it back to weed and uh, legalization, here is where my stance on voting changes and why I don't take the same moral stance as uh, most agorists do. It's that when you get down to the very most local level, where voting actually can enact change, voting for a politician on any level is not going to enact any change, in my opinion. But when you get down to the brass tacks and you get down to, in Florida, for example, assault weapons mains and other gun laws, have to go through the constitutional amendment process, which cannot be done solely from a congressional level. It, so the way it has to be done is, first, you need 
petitions. You need to petition it to get onto the ballot. So already, this has to be something that really the majority of the people in the state have to agree with, and they have to sign this petition. So once it has a percentage of votes from the, from the petitions, then it can get onto the ballot. And then on the ballot is where it gets determined if it's going to be heard by Congress or not. And then from there, Congress votes on it. So if there's going to be an assault weapons ban, it's very unlikely that it happens because Florida is a very gun-friendly state. So if it passes the petition, that happens very rarely, but it can happen. It then dies on the, on the ballot because it dies like 70 to 30. <laughs> Uh, 70% of the state is saying, like, no, fuck no, you're not putting an assault weapons ban. So I think in a situation like that, voting can actually have an effect. So if there was a, an initiative to legalize weed in Florida, and part of it would be that with this amendment being passed, people have to be freed from Florida prisons from, for weed offenses. And you're telling me that there is an opportunity to stop people from going to jail for owning a plant and we can free people from prisons for owning a plant, I can put aside my moral and utilitarian stances on voting and say, hey, this outweighs what I personally well, even think. even then, that would be utilitarian in that sense. Mm -hmm. It would be, because it outweighs what I personally think is best. If you believe voting is violence, then it becomes a question of what's more violent. Putting in this vote and telling people, no, you cannot throw people in a rape cage for owning a plant anymore or allowing people to continue being thrown in a rape cage for owning a plant. So personally, I would throw my personal morals aside and say, hey, stopping this from happening is more important than being a pure libertarian. Another um, thing I just thought about, bringing it back to that book, Rules for Radicals, uh, by Saul Dialensky. Of course, I quoted it a lot on Twitter. I think I've quoted it some on Instagram uh, back before the incident um, of me deleting my account on accident. Um, but... One of the, my favorite chapters is called Of Means and Ends. Um, and it, it, that's what really got me on the thing with voting. And it very much applies to your defensive vote, like you said. Um, it, it changes the, uh, the sentence, uh, do the ends justify the means? Do these particular ends justify these particular means? And in almost every instance, when you take that analogy of it, rather than uh, do the ends justify the means, um, it always comes out, yes, these particular ends justify the In the sense of you wanting to free people from prevent people from for owning a plant, that particular end of saving those people, uh, he has his headphones off, you're going to hear me, but I'm going to be talking. Um, that particular end of saving those people justifies that particular means of voting uh, for the legalization bill to get sent to the Congress. Did you hear the rest uh, that I was saying? Yeah. Okay. I just saw you had your headphones off. Um, part fell off. But do you take do you take that concept of these particular in, particular means apply it to any sort of circumstance in, in voting, like for example, pushing for a, a overall more libertarian society? Some people say voting is immoral. Okay, that's great, but how is it going? What's going to be the more immediate? Like, what's the quickest way to do that? It's going to be through voting, or the quickest and safest way. It's going to be through voting. So in that sense. Do the ends of having a more liberal society justify the means of voting, regardless of your morals? I'd say yes, because if you're trying to, achieve, if the goal is achieving a more society, then the safest and fastest way, compared to the other ways, well, maybe not at this point, but in a more general sense, it's going to be voting. Given the current economic situation, I think agorism is the better way to go, mostly both for counter economic reasons and for your own personal safety. Financially yeah. speaking, um, on an individual level, it's a lot better. But in a, um, in, a, in a society where not everything is basically at, straight out of a blockbuster movie, um, I, I'd say uh, voting is probably the better strategy. Uh, just, just from the analysis of particular ends and means, rather than just ends and means. The world ended eight years ago and we were in one giant YouTube skit. Someone mentioned, I saw a tweet. Uh, earlier today saying the world ended in 2012 with the Mayan calendar <laughs> it's just been all one big <laughs> SNL skit yeah I think that was Ace or Kissed <laughs> yeah, I don't remember where I saw it from I think Ace I saw is, it on Instagram Ace is great like if you've never talked to him personally he's great he's alright I don't like a lot of his views but you know 
And he's and he's really he's really good to talk to. Even if you disagree yeah. with him, he's a smart guy, and you will have very interesting. Like you especially, I can see you having because I've talked to him a lot about philosophy in the DMs, mm -hmm. and like you could have very interesting conversations with him. Well, that's good to know. I doubt I'll ever get around to that, but oh, well, you probably won't. But if you ever do, you're gonna enjoy yeah. it. But um, anyway, I'm surprised we had see, see. There's actually a lot of things we agree on. We don't have to be at each other's throats. I think yeah, it's just for the memes. Yeah. Um, also, it's because I'm I'm a little buzzed, so my mind is not as emotional right now. Yeah, I you're very easy going. going on, so my anger is not. <laughs> the booze keeps the bipolar in check. Oh, it does. It keeps these. It keeps his beating hands steady. <laughs> um. Yeah, that was a good episode. I'm 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 happy with that one. I'm definitely gonna advertise this one for sure. Um good old party politics episode. Yeah, but I think uh I think we've beat the dead horse enough. So Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I'll I'll uh, close this out here. Uh thank you guys for listening to the Insurrection Podcast. It's been of course an episode of just me and Jay. Pretty good episode. Um a few announcements for those who are still here. Um, we have, of course, the merch store has been launched. Uh, a lot of good designs in there. A lot of uh, Black Markets Matter merchandise is sold, <laughs> um, which is probably one of my favorite designs. Yeah, it's, a, it's the uh, most we have We have more designs coming. They're in the works. We have constant ideas flowing. Uh, it's more than just Insurrection Inc. themed stuff. Obviously, I could just mentioned Black Markets Matter. Uh, we have that design and a whole bunch of other non-Insurrection Inc. themed design. Yeah. We're trying to focus on a more liber liberty and libertarian design and not trying to push our... Um, podcast as much because people don't want to be let's be honest people don't want to walk around yeah. some two fal's crossover microphone on a hoodie yeah. nobody wants that i mean, us as hosts probably would i think that'd be pretty cool i probably will eventually get one but um normal people don't uh like i said black Eyes markets matter we have stacks flight school we have uh say's law firm we have peace he sells Myers. but who's buying and hey myers uh hey myers garage um we have the cool strati guevara shirt oh yeah we have the strati guevara <laughs> shirt um that's a good one that's a that's a classic those have been around for a while we'll know what that one's referencing or if they even have a good memory um i think that's it i think that's all the do we have yeah, any upcoming uh, interviews yeah we're gonna be interviewing pete quinones soon oh i forgot about that when is that happening uh, Actually, we'll talk about it after the show don't worry about that yeah and we got um well by the time this releases already go back and listen to the thomas de lorenzo episode that was a very good one Super smart dude. Great to talk to. Uh, he endorsed I, us or endorsed the yeah. other host, at least. I wasn't there. Yeah, we are, <laughs> no, he endorsed the show. We're three times better than the Tom Woods show because uh, Tom Woods only had him on for 30 minutes. We had him on for an hour and a half. So it's oh. mathematically proven. We are three times better than Tom better. Woods. Yeah. That's a W. Uh, no, no, no other plugs besides that. Uh, if you want to support us on Patreon, you can. I don't know why you would. I forgot we had that. You can support us on Float. Uh, Bitbacker is no longer Bitbacker. It's float.app. You can go support us with cryptocurrency. That would help a lot because... I prefer that, actually. Yeah, my $1,200 in cryptocurrency got yeah, stolen last month. <laughs> I don't know how. I was looking into that. Uh, either it was something I torrented, but I don't think because it was too targeted. So I think the wallet I was using has some in some internal flaws that allow it to be hacked because a lot of updates have had uh, flaws in it, security issues. So I have recently bought a hardware wallet, which is coming in a uh, day after we recorded this. So I'll probably talk about that on another episode. But besides that, uh, those are the three ways you can support us. Merch shop, Patreon, Float. Our Instagram Give, and Twitters will be in the description or in the yeah. show notes or whatever. Of course, leave us a rating on guys too. Yeah. Leave us a rating on iTunes. Leave us a uh, like and subscribe on YouTube if you listen to there. Besides that, uh, this was a good episode. So... Uh, take care, everybody.